All right, so we got a really cool one here today, but in order to talk about it, we got to give some context over the last few weeks. So over the last few weeks, we've been spending some time on the Ceph subreddit, and there's been some really good talks on there. You've been spending some time on the subreddit. Okay, I've been spending some time on the subreddit, and I've been telling everyone about it. <laughs> um, so recently there was one post on there where someone came in, they had a very specific workload that they wanted to achieve, and not only did they have a workload, they had a file test to go along with it. So they knew exactly what the workload behaved like, and they were saying, hey, can you achieve 10,000 IOPS with a Ceph cluster with this specific workload. Oh my God, so the dream. Yeah, Someone the dream. actually knew what they were looking for. Yeah, not only do they have the work pattern, they have the actual FIO test that proves exactly what they want. And it, for anyone that doesn't know what FIO is, we will get into that a little bit more. But yeah, so that was really, really cool. Now, there was a really good discussion around that. Um, and it ended up devolving into a whole bunch of other things. But one of the main things I talked about was why drive selection is so important in Ceph. Mm -hmm. uh, be, and the reason why it was on my mind is we had a... a and sorry to interrupt. When you yeah. say drive selection, in this case, you really meant like NVMe drive yeah. selection versus uh, consumer, and, consumer enterprise, and enterprise or was it more in general? Yeah, no, it was consumer versus enterprise specifically. For was, NVMe. For NVMe. Yeah, and gotcha. it was because like I had that on my mind because we were dealing with a, a, a consultation customer recently who, who had built a Ceph cluster, 12 nodes, and they built it on Samsung Pros and they thought they, those were gonna be good enough. And unfortunately, it just wasn't the case. Um, so anyway, that was a big part of that. Now with that, Mark Nelson from Clisso also chimed in. So Mark Nelson, uh, anyone that's been around the Ceph world for a while definitely knows who he is. He's a former Ceph developer and now he works at Clisso as one of the kind of big uh, leaders of Ceph as well. Yeah, I've his I've seen his name over the years. Yeah, I've absolutely. I've learned a lot of things through him yeah. through message boards and, and mailing lists and everything. Definitely. But. So he was on there as well and he saw the 10K IOPS challenge and he was like, I think we could definitely do that. So what he decided to do was go off and make a blog. Say, hey, can we achieve this with I believe it was a six node Ceph cluster with one Samsung four terabyte NVMe per node. Uh, and to see if we could hit it. And the blog's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Really, really great blog. But the funny thing about all this is... So, this is kind of why we're here today. Yeah, yeah exactly. kind of why we're here today is uh, he somehow took uh, my idea of me making that video about the drive selection and thought that I was also wanting to do the 10K IOPS number. And so essentially a, a challenge or a gauntlet was thrown down to say they are going to achieve it. Now 45 drives are going to run and try and, to get as well. And we, we don't back down from a challenge. <laughs> Definitely. I, back mean, down from a challenge. I mean, we're going to try. Yeah. So it spilled over to LinkedIn uh, and we saw a whole lot of steaks being raised with uh, poutine. Maple syrup. Maple syrup, a whole bunch of stuff. I got to say, I'll do the testing, but I'm going to opt out of the actual contest oh, if we no, lose. Not, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll fall on that sword for you, yeah, buddy. Okay. There we go. If we lose. If we lose. Um, now, that being said, Mark did fantastic work as would as you would expect, right? Yeah. Proved obviously unequivocally that for that specific workload, Ceph is more than up to the task, especially on NVMe. Yeah. And so we saw him, we're like, well, let's try to take that challenge a little further. Yeah, because at the same time, like it'd be interesting to do it again. Yep. But like if we're talking challenges and we want to have some fun with it and put some showmanship in it, yeah. maybe we can do it with something besides NVMe. Exactly. Maybe SATA SSDs can yeah. solve the problem. That is exactly what we're thinking. So they had about 24 terabytes of NVMe um, and we have about 26 terabytes of SATA SSDs. Now we may have a few more SATA SSDs than they had NVMe SSDs, but hey, no one's here claiming that NVMe and SATA are on the same uh, level as far oh, as performance it, NVMe is the fastest drives in the world right exactly. now. Exactly. If, if I was to quote that super bad quote, ah, it's a fast kid a lot. Uh, <laughs> if you know, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, NVMe's are out of this world fast. Exactly. But the thing is, the plumbing to get that kind of speed, I say plumbing in quotes, the, yeah. the HBA cards, yep. the, the throughput and everything you need, it's pricey. Pretty you can get a yep. lot of performance out of say to SSDs yep. with less expense gear. Exactly. So there's still a good spot in this world for SSDs. Yep. Or sorry, say to SSDs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and when we talk about why NVMe is so much better than say to SSDs, like the two things that you can kind of look at that are great is one, obviously NVMe has access to PCI Express, mm -hmm. which is much more bandwidth, much more actual uh, data path rather yeah, they, than SATA. They, they get the fast express line right Exactly, to the right to the CPU. Yeah. And then the other one is just how high the Q depth support they have, right? It's it's infinitely, uh, functionally infinitely larger than what SATA can do. So if you have a workload that has a very, very high Q depth, NVMe can be fantastic for it. But, I mean, but that's let's put that aside. Yeah, and, and just in this case too, like Q depth is, you're, you're essentially saying like, 
uh, what was the analogy you told me earlier? It was like, if we're all lining up to get some service, like say at the, the DMV or yep. Access Nova Scotia here locally. Or the bartender. Or the bartender or whatever. Um, in, you, you could just put a bunch of people in line, churn through them, rather yep. than the bartender doing one at a time instead of everyone back down to their seat and say, yeah, come exactly. up later. You got it, yeah. exactly, right? Like, whereas the SATA SSD might say, hey, go home for an hour and, and then come back and I'll serve you once I'm yeah. ready. The MVM could just line everybody up and start bringing them in very, very quickly. Okay, so, so high Q depth. Really Direct I/O path right into the CPU. NVMe's yep. are fast. Yep. SSDs are still darn fast, especially over hard drives. Yep. So we are taking the challenge, the NVMe challenge, and we're countering with the SATA SSD challenge. And for fun, at the end, we might just, for a laugh, see what HDDs can. For do. a laugh, for a lark, <laughs> just to see, just to see what it does. All right, so we had a little fun in the intro for sure, but it's time to get into business here. And the first thing on the docket is let's take a look at this FIO test. Or first, let's talk about FIO. What general. is FIO? What is FIO? FIO. FIO, Flexible IO Tester. Does that tell you everything you need to know? Yep, it does. Okay, great, let's move on. <laughs> no, no, but seriously, it's, uh, it's an IO workload generator, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when people think of benchmarking, they think of a tool that could just generate a bunch of workload on a storage system or depending on whatever you're benchmarking. But where FIO is really cool, and I wouldn't say unique, but really, really cool, is that it has so much breadth of different options and things you can do with it, where you can emulate and simulate pretty much any workload out there. If you it's know a double-edged sword. It's incredibly powerful, yep. but because of that, it's so complex, and for the uninitiated, yeah. it's scary. Because yep. it's like, what the hell does half the stuff mean? Exactly, exactly. And I also want to raise the point too, is like you said the magic word benchmarking, and we spent a lot of time with that too. Benchmarking is really like, really at the end of the day, it's it's useful for comparing two systems. Yes. Really, and that's what we're doing with Five here. It's a good benchmark tool, but at the same time, it's a good workload generation tool. Yeah, absolutely. If you understand which workload you're generating with it. Yes. Exactly. And that's what that's we're going to talk about right now. that's the hard part, yeah, right, is getting yeah. to that, that meat of it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. why don't you tell us what the workload is, okay, I so guess. I guess we'll start with just some of the options in the file testing question. We'll throw it up on the board and maybe talk about it. Sure, but actually, why don't before that, like, let's just... Mm, oh, generally, like, words, what's, what's like, the workload? What is the... Before we translate it, I guess, yep, it's like yep. what what are we trying to solve with this? Does it what what are right. we, what workload are we simulating? Great question. We'll so we we'll use our words. First. <laughs> use our words. So I, I don't know a whole lot about his specific workload in the application. So he did mention it's Ethereum of some kinds of some kind of blockchain workload. Oh, okay, cool. But when we're looking at the actual test, we can see that it's a 4K block size, so very very small block size. It has a fairly high queue depth, so the I/O depth thing that we were talking about, which means whatever the application is, it's able to queue up a lot of I/O very very quickly for the storage system, and that is very beneficial. So yeah. some applications like a uh, transactional database, for example, will have very, very low queue depth because it's very hard to know what one write request to the next to the next is going to be because it's very, very randomized. Whereas some applications, well, even though they're random, they're able to queue up a whole lot of I.O. very, very quickly. Um, and so this one definitely signifies as an application that has a, a fairly high application queue depth. And if we look at the rest of the workload, we can see it's mixed read and write, which Think about any use case, right? People will benchmark just writes or just reads, but very few workloads are actually just one or the other. So it's really helpful to have both running simultaneously. So this workload is a workload that will have, in this case, 25% write and 75% read simultaneously. Okay, cool. Let's, uh, let's draw it out. Yeah, yeah, so we home. definitely talked about a lot of it, but let, let's just do some of the ones that are could be a little confusing. So the first one, I guess, would be rand repeat equals one. So we got our file. So we're literally just gonna, we're gonna write out the, the command com line argument that you'd run to write this test, and we'll just define yep. every argument. Absolutely. Cool. So we're saying uh, rand repeat equals one. So rand repeat equals one is a good option if you want to run a test many, many times. So what this is saying is we want a random data set, but we want it random in a way that is predictable every time you run it. So it's not gonna be a complete different set of random tests. Apples every to single apples. Time. Exactly, so that's what we're saying there. Uh, the next one comes into the IO engine. So the IO engine in this case is libAIO. 
So it's a specific IO engine that File has. So File has multiple different ones that you can use. So there's one specifically for Windows, like Windows AIO, LibIO. This is just a great all-purpose Linux. Uh, asynchronous Asynchronous IO. AIO, exactly. Um, so the next one, direct equals one. So this, this is a is good a one. Yep. So direct IO essentially signifies that you want your workload to bypass the page cache of the operating system. You're saying go direct to disk and work there. Don't use the cache. Kind of rule number one of measuring your disk's performance of the workload. Exactly. Try to cut the RAM out of it. Now yep. in real life, you'll get RAM and that's great. Yep. But if you really want to know what the disks can do, whether it's NVMe hard drives or anything in between, yep. Yep. you're going to say, Skip the rant. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Cool. You don't want to get that big cash buffer in the way and not real really know your real numbers. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the next one is an interesting one. GTOD underscore reduce equals one. Get time of day reduce equals one. So as file runs through its benchmark, it's constantly getting time of day updates against the system. And the reason why it does that is so it can very, very precisely measure the latency of the IO that's coming in, but it also will reduce the performance overall because it's constantly having to send out those it's calls. busy doing something busy else. Busy doing other things. So what this can do is get your CPU out of the way a little bit or, or I guess the workload out of the way a little bit to focus on the IO. So, but you won't get as precise latency numbers. Gotcha. In this case, we're fine with that. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, next, next is the name, but we can skip that. That's literally just the name it's of name your test. test. Uh, and then we have file name. So that's where you're going to write it. So again, I'll just write simple. this down because yep. it is kind of a key yeah, part. Of absolutely. Say test file. Yep. It's literally the name of the file that this that is going to generate. Yep. And okay. depending on what our size is, that will be the size of the file. Gotcha. Okay. So the next couple we've already gone through, but we'll put them up. So BS is block size. Bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that is the size of the I/O that it's going through for every single uh, read and write. Or yeah, read and write. And 4K, four kilobytes. Four kilobytes. Where exactly. it's operating four kilobyte chunks. Yep. And then the next Small one tile. is IO depth equals Ooh, okay. 64. So this is Q depth, right? Q depth, yeah. you got it. Yep. And this is to say that this application is able to queue what up. We know 64. 64. Upwards of 64 of those 4K chunks be ready for the storage system to just take in as quickly as it can. And sorry, but like with this, this Q depth, right? Yep. And what you were saying with NVMe, it's damn near infinitely scalable. Exactly. Yeah, but like. If I keep increasing this number, yep. I can pretty much make the numbers that come out of this benchmark go up and up, up and, up, and up. up and up. Exactly. If I did this with SSDs, it could probably be 64. I might even be able to go to 128 and it'll probably give me more. Yep. But like, there for will example, be a but point our hard drives will find its ceiling. So yep. that's really like, you got so with, with these faster and faster devices, they operate so fast, but yep. we can also tell more shit to get in line. To, to be get in line and get ready, exactly. You probably mouth this video on that. <laughs> I'm just that excited. <laughs> Yo, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, no, so perfect analogy. Next, we have our size. So this is the size of the file file itself. So we are doing a 150 gigabyte file as the user specified. Okay. We might make that a little smaller for the hard drive test because that might take a while. Um, next we have our read write pattern. So dash dash read write and then you specify what do you want. Do you want sequential writes, sequential oh, reads? Read, right? Yep. Uh, random reads, random writes. So we're doing random RW which means random reads and writes. Cool. Okay, and then we have our RW mixed read, which means what percentage of this workload is going to be read? And in this case, it's 75%. Rand. RW. Oh, sorry, R RW mixed read. Mixed read. It gets hard when you get lower on the board. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bear with me. Uh, right? um, RW mixed read. And sorry, say that again. This is the percentage of what, uh, what a read, much what a write. Exactly, you got it. So, so it's going to be 75% read, 25% write, which is a pretty common thing you'll see, right? Typically, people read much more often than they write. Uh, and then finally, in this case, we are also going to output it to a file, but that's actually only when we do multi-thread. So we can leave it right there. Um, yeah, so you run this like this. You run it in a command, all your results are coming out in standard out. You got it, yep. Okay, or you can give it output, output to, to a file and it'll go into the file. And then you can store that cool. there for later. Yep. And it stores everything. You get bandwidth yep. numbers, you get I.O. numbers, you get latency, you exactly. get everything. Files are awesome. It's one of our favorite tools here. Now, when you use a higher Q depth, the latency number starts to be less matter. It doesn't matter quite as much. The I.O. depth is one. You truly are measuring the latency of each I.O. So True, as you start because, cranking that yeah, out, yeah, it makes sense. So which is good that we're using the get time of day reduce because we don't really care about the latency as much. But this is our workload generator. This is our, our workload. workload that we're simulating. Yep. So this is okay. exactly what we're going to be running on and this cluster. 
our friend who gave this clear ask in the Reddit chat, yep. this is what he wanted to see, and he wanted to know if the NVMe Ceph cluster could yep. achieve could achieve 10K, 10K IOPS total. IOPS total using this test. Yep, and when we say total, we mean between both read and write, it just has to combine to be 10K. Okay. Mark did it with NVMe. Yep. And it worked. And it worked. He got what he wanted. Spectacular and he results. Went, and he went north and he went further. Yeah, I believe he went even to 16 clients simultaneously to see how much overhead there was left. Cool. Great results there. And we'll do a little bit of the same as well. And then again, like we said in the beginning of the video, why duplicate the work? Let's see if we can yeah, make it work on a slightly stuff. slower media. So yeah. we're going to do it on SATA. Absolutely. So can we, this is what we want to see at the end. That's what we want to see as our I like drawing boxes That's our goal. Things. That's our goal to hit. So yeah. Let's dive into it. Okay, cool. All right, so I think we've done a great job at setting the stage here. Mm -hmm. um, now let's dive into the actual environment itself. So uh, the blog on the Ceph.io blog, well, that's a little redundant, but the blog itself is going to be in the description down below that Mark did. And so if you want to know exactly the specifics of his environment, you can get all that information from here. I'm going to specify this environment here. So we have a four node Ceph cluster. Uh, the CPU is running 4216 Xeon, so 16 core, 32 thread. We've got 128 gigs of DDR4. We're on 40 gigabit networking. Mm -hmm. We've got 56 480 gigabyte Micron 5300 Pro SATA SSDs, mm -hmm. which our test is going to be run on. And we've also got 56 12 terabyte Seagate Exos hard drives that we'll try it on as well. Wonderful. And we'll get those results. Uh, and we're running Rocky Linux, and we are running Octopus 15.2.18. Um, so... With all that out of the way, let's uh, run our test. I'm excited. All right, so we have an RBD mounted here. Uh, I've already uh, zeroed it out, so we have all the objects created. So we are gonna get the best of result as possible. So it is at SSD 10K, so that's what I'm gonna CD into. D 10K, uh, no, didn't like that. Oh yeah, there we go. All right, so I'm just gonna copy paste this file test and we'll get a look at what we get for a single job with SATA SSD. It works, I don't wanna eat a maple syrup. <laughs> uh, yes, all right, so we'll, we'll let this go for a bit, but already we can see we're smashing those numbers yeah. absolutely all day. So smashing for, those numbers, you better be smashing that like button. No, I'm just kidding, <laughs> that's, that's, that's weak. That's, Sorry, uh, keep going, Mitch, I'm, I'm just... Try to steal um, your spotlight, buddy. Keep going. 42,000 on the read IOPS mm -hmm. and 14.1 thousand on the write IOPS all day of the week. Um, so With 56 SATA SSDs. 56 SATA SSDs. So they're 480 gigs, so they're very small. And, and it works out to be pretty much the exact same storage overall footprint as far as uh, usable space. Cool. Um, so that being said, uh, would you need 56 SATA SSDs to hit 10K IOPS total? Not even close, like 100% not. And we can show that pretty clearly by also running multiple jobs simultaneously, similar to what Mark did. Right? Okay. Yep. He, he ran 16. I'm going to use Ansible to spin up four simultaneously. Um, that's all I had it in me to, to get ready. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> uh, but yeah. I mean, it does beg the question of like how few SSDs. Exactly, you could actually get to to still hit that number reliably. And I guess we're, um, we're literally filming right now, so I shouldn't change the scope. Right now, but that would be cool to see <laughs> at some cool. point. Too. Yeah, it'd be a great yeah. follow-up video for sure. Yeah. So before we move on, I'm just going to mark our results here as it goes, because you know, spoiler alert, I've ran this in the in the background a few times already, so I know what we're going to get. Oh, you left <laughs> me hanging this long. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to put the results. These are very much uh, what we'll see all the way through. So. Let's say we did about 42.5K read IOPS and about 14.3 write IOPS. Okay. All right, so that is a single job. So now let's move on to spawning four simultaneously and on a different RBD and I have four clients ready to go. So. So let's go. So just to clarify again re real quick there's yep. like we pretty much just single cliented that first one. Exactly. That was like if yep. I had one client hit my distributed Ceph cluster yep. to do its work. At this point now what you're about to do is four simultaneous clients 
hitting doing the exact same workload. Are we hitting the same RVD block or is it four separate four RVDs? Four separate RVDs. So they're all their own personal storage yep. on the cluster, but exactly. the cluster is servicing all four of those clients. You got it, yep. Okay. It's a, and, cool. and actually, I can spin up by another terminal, and so we can do a Ceph-S, I'll watch it while the four tests are running, and we can see just what the, the Ceph cluster itself is reporting. But yeah, that, that is important to, to really touch on for people is, this is one single job, meaning one thread that's doing reads and writes simultaneously, similar to applications will do, right? And now what we're doing is we're spawning that out to four doing the exact same thing. Because it's the best part of a cluster. It's massive amount of disks in exactly. there. The more parallelism we can give into it, the more performance we pull out. Yeah, Ceph really, really shines at the parallelism. Uh, that's a fun word to say, and I'm, I think I pulled it off. But hey, yeah, you did a great job. <laughs> man. You did a great job. So, Proud of you. <laughs> thanks, Proud bud. Of you. I appreciate yeah. that. All right, so let's run this test, and all it is is an Ansible ad hoc command wrapped with a file, and we're just going to run the same test. But in this case, we're actually going to output it to a file, output the result to a file. Uh, so then I can quickly just parse it uh, once it's finished. Um, yeah, Ansible is really useful for running playbooks. So a series of tasks to get a bunch of work done, but it's also really useful to run ad hoc tasks, like he just said, exactly. meaning that we can just run a bunch of things in parallel at the same time. Typically, you'd have to write some annoying little bash loop or something like that, and uh, you know, yeah. but nope. Thanks, <laughs> Ansible, we love you. Um, and so the only other thing too I'm gonna do is I am gonna reduce the size. I just don't want to wait here while it lays out. All oh, it's like the it's like the old cooking shows, right? Yeah. It's like they do all the prep work, and they're like, oh, "Put it in the oven," yeah, and exactly. then all the it's done. So yeah, we're gonna do 25 thing. gigs, which is still fairly big. Yeah. All right. Okay. So here we go. And actually, before I do it, let's spin up another terminal very quickly. And let's just watch. Ceph -S. Ceph -S. All right. So no client I/O right now, right? Um, literally next to nothing at all. All right, so here we go. We're gonna spin this up across four clients. And very quickly, we should see, this is gonna to start to increase pretty quick. Usually I find Ceph-S to be about six, five seconds behind what you're seeing, but we can see, here we go. It's starting to increase, we're, wow, yeah, very much so. 2.4 gigabytes, but uh, I'm looking for a very, very high number of read and write IOPS, which should spawn pretty, pretty soon here. There we go. Oh yeah, because of the Ansible ad hoc, it's capturing that standard out output, so we're not seeing that regular old exactly. file stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I put it to a file. Yeah, smart. Yeah. Oh no, we're getting scrubs at the same time. Oh wow. <laughs> Great though, because yeah. you should be scrubbing your data all the yep. time, yep. and that's one thing you'll see with this stuff, it's like, oh, I want to get the best speed of it. Okay, disable scrubbing and all this extra stuff. You're like, but no, I I want all the data safety yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of for the best that yep. we're doing that. Actually, right? This is very real. That is such a great point because like you see a lot of tests, and I'm not throwing shade at you, Mark, uh, of people that will like disable CephX and, and all these things or reduce the logs way down to almost yeah. nothing of the OCs. It's like, eh, I wouldn't do that in a real environment. So, But it is fun to get those dyno <coughs> numbers from time to time, now, right? I hate to interrupt you right there, but I'm seeing 100 k IOPS yep, right now. Yep. We're, we're on the read side and he, we're at about 34K on the right side. So nice. getting some pretty good numbers. And I, I still think there's there's more uh, available there. If we split up a couple more clients, I think we could still keep scaling this thing. Uh, but that's a pretty good showcase that obviously we're, we're definitely not close to uh, what what this cluster could do with a single, single client. Okay. So I, we'll, we'll let this finish uh, because what I want to do is at the end, I'll just generate the results and, and then Maybe we'll try the HTD. Oh, deadly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll just uh, we'll wait here a few seconds. Once it finishes, we'll come back. All right, so we are done. The test is done. It looks like it's all wrapped up. So let's take a look at our results here. So I just got a little loop that we can pull our, our results file very quickly. Loop daddy. Loop daddy indeed. Mark Ribelet. <laughs> so let's first grab the reads, and then we'll grab the writes. Cool, so what are we looking at? All right, so each job for the reads was in between 28,000 IOPS and 21,000. So 28, 28, 22, 21. All right, I'm calculating so, it. Yep, you calculate her up. The last video I shot with Doug, I had to do a lot of head math, and uh, <laughs> I'm not doing that again. Yeah. What am I looking at? 28.3 yep. plus 22.0 plus 21.3 plus 28.2. So you're looking at 99.8K read IO. Okay, and right IOPS, we've got 9,454. We got 7351. Yeah. We got 7107. Yeah. And 9391. 
93, 91. So there we're looking at 33.3K. 33.3K. And it was 99.8 for the reads. 99.8. All right. So clearly a whole lot of uh, additional room left over for additional reads. Because we could see like, yeah, obviously the read and write per client went down a little bit. But not a whole lot, right? We stayed pretty darn strong there, uh, which is nice. Okay. Now, so before we wrap up, two things I want to talk about. First thing, it's like, say it is not going nowhere. We love NVMe. We have a new NVMe server coming up very soon. You may have NVMe seen the teaser. NVMe is the future. It is the future indeed, especially the U.3 spec that we built on. Yeah. Uh, so really excited to start bringing out some content yeah. centered around that. Yeah, U.3 um, and then everything onwards, yep. Exactly, but I mean, there's still a very real reason to go with SSD and SATA. Yep, for Seth. They, they work great. Yep. I mean, manufacturers are going to start building more NVMe than they're going to make SATA drives. So, like, they're as long as long as they still keep offering yep. SATA drives, the plumbing, like as I said earlier, exactly. the, the 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 PCI lanes and yep. the HPA cards, everything you need to get these good speeds out of here. Like, we're still operating Gen three like 9300 series LSI cards. Yeah, like, yeah, they, exactly. They, they're very well Commodity, uh, very, priced, very well priced relative to this next gen NVMe yeah, exactly. stuff. So yep. we are excited of the lightning fast speeds that are coming out of NVMe. We're gonna be able to achieve some pretty crazy things. I can't wait to do this again with the NVMe machine. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely gonna say revisit SSDs, this. That can solve a lot of problems too, Absolutely. especially on a budget. Yep. So. Uh, we're definitely gonna wrap up, right? Because we covered a lot, but like we gotta just see what hard drives can do. Yo, you said it three so, times. Like, you can't yeah. leave <laughs> So there's no journals on these things. They're literally just straight up HD. So Pure no spinners. No yeah. rocks, DB, wall, uh, SSD device. So first, people call them spinning over. rust, and maybe I've become too in love with hard drives, but I feel <laughs> like they're not rusty. They're they're not rusty. They, uh, they work really hard. Well, we do live by the sea, and I guess <laughs> if you're close enough to the Atlantic Ocean. It may All right, get run rusty. this test. We're getting a little loopy here, buddy. We gotta go. All right, so here we go. Let's see what we're gonna get here. All right, so let, let's see. Maybe it's gonna improve a little bit, but we can see clearly there is a reason why people go with SSD over HD for certain workloads. Yep. Right? You need very large streaming read and write workloads, larger block size, not a lot of IOPS. Hard drives can deliver that in spades. Yep. Latency sensitive workloads Latency that require sensitive. high IOPS yep. want some flash. Exactly. You've got very, very small file and you want to transfer a lot of files, a hard drive is going to have a lot harder time with that than a regular SSD will. And and you know what, we're going to dive into this a whole lot more over the coming weeks, so let's just, I'll leave it there. Um, but yeah, so. We're looking at about 1,600 read IOPS, 600 write IOPS out of a 54 hard drive, four node Ceph cluster. Okay. So that looks pretty normal to me. Um, anything else, any conclusions? I'm not eating a poutine with maple syrup. Me it. neither, I'm definitely not doing that. Um, so if we really have to, we'll come back once the uh, NVMe cluster is ready to go and we'll blow those numbers. Oh, we really have to, <laughs> it'll be fun. Yeah, all yeah. right, sounds good. Thanks a lot for watching, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed making it. Uh, definitely comment down below to see what you want to see next. Thank you to our Reddit friend who posed the question. Thank Absolutely. you to Mark Nelson for the shout out challenge yes. and fun interaction. This was great to do. Yeah, no, it was really fun. So awesome, awesome stuff all around. See you later.